Okay, I want to say welcome to everybody to, uh, for attending our webinar this morning. We're happy to welcome Dr. Laura Blaisdell from the Maine Academy of American Pediatrics. Um, and I want to um, first start by saying that if you have any questions and you're joining us on Zoom, please feel free to use our question and answer box or our Zoom chat box to ask those questions. If you're joining us live on Facebook, please use the Facebook chat box and we'll make sure to get your questions answered. Where So we are live streaming on Facebook and we're also recording this webinar so it will be available to watch after both on Facebook and on our YouTube page which will be available on our website. Um, we will have a poll at the end of this, so if you can hang tight and take a few minutes to fill out a quick poll, we are a nonprofit grant funded, so getting your feedback is very, very important to us. With that, I'm going to hand over the webinar now to Dr. Laura Blaisdell and thank her for joining us. She does want to make this a, um, a, a conversation. She does have a small PowerPoint, but she wants to make sure that um, she's answering the questions that you're coming here with today. So please feel free to um, ask the questions and we'll make this as much of a conversation as we possibly can. So thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Blaisdell, and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining this morning. Um, um, I appreciate and am honored about uh, the opportunity to speak to um, uh, this this group with parents and with concerned um, parents as we head back uh, to thinking about opening schools in the fall. Um, I think I, I, I want to first um, uh, just say that the American Academy of Pediatrics, myself and Maine's pediatricians are here and uh, to work through this process as we move forward. This is an unprecedented um, year for schools, for children, for families, um, and there are there's no way around this pandemic. There's only a way through, and so we need to work together um, with understanding uh, that there's not a, a one size fits all. Um, method for moving forward. So uh, while I speak, um, I want to, uh, you know, couch it in this understanding that um, we're going to have to um, be highly understanding of individuals' needs, um, their, their definition of safety, their definition of risk as we move forward um, this year. So um, with that, I'm going to just do a very quick PowerPoint um, uh, and um, then I want to move it over to questions. So um, when we talk about uh, reopening schools, um, the American Academy of Pediatrics um, did recommend that we uh, looked at how to open schools. I think their, um, their call was a call to arms, was to say, let, let's figure out um, how we can do this and if we can do this for kids safely in a way that uh, maximizing, maximizing safety learning and the well-being of teachers, children, and staff. Um, so there, there are ways to do this. It's not impossible, um, but uh, the, the AAP um, wants to make sure that we do it as safely as possible. I think it's important and, and probably not, not necessary to say that this, this is a polarized topic, um, that many people feel like there's no way that schools can open, um, and many people uh, feel like the school, that, um, uh, that children should remain in a distance learning model. Many people feel that schools should open. Um, and all of these options contain risk. All of them do. Um, there are risks for keeping children at home and away from the social emotional learning that they need to do at school. There are risks to children um, who don't have access to the services and needs that they um, need to, you know, to grow and, and to thrive. So all of these um, options contain risk and I think that that's that's the crux of the debate, is which risks are we willing to tolerate um, in, uh, as we head through this, this time where there's no right answers. Um, you know, we're continuing to learn. I think that's another uh, uh, conundrum about this pandemic is that we, while we learn um, uh, about things uh, in terms of how children and how others respond when they get COVID, how, um, how public health interventions are either working or not working in various environments, um, we're, we're, we're learning as we go along. I also, I mean, I don't think the um, the science by press release helps either. Um, you know, we we are trying as the academic and scientific communities to put forth data that is um, as true as it can be for the moment, but um, we find that 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 data is twisted in the political environment um, to support different agendas. 
Um, I think another challenging part of reopening schools is that the pandemic response has been driven at the state and local level and not at the federal level. So we don't see a lot of overarching guidance um, uh, at the federal level. Um, it, guidelines have come late in the game to Maine. Um, Maine is one of the few states that has the opportunity to open um, in terms of our uh, circulating COVID rates, but our guidelines did come, come late. And it, you know, as a pediatrician, you know, I, I think about if children sat on the boards, if children sat on school boards, if children sat on our, our um, health, um, you know, the CDC boards, what would they say? Um, what would they say about what they want in terms of returning to school? Um, what would they say in terms of um, whether we should open bars or schools? Um, you know, what, what would they say? So I really try to think about um, being a voice for children um, when, when, I, when I think about um, policy and, and politic. Um, so I think, first of all, uh, I would like to just talk about that it takes a village. You know, community transmission rates are allowing for this discussion about how schools open in Maine. There are other states that aren't having these discussions. I was telling Carrie before when, I, um, when we were talking that I'm working with some schools in LA who don't have the opportunity to have these discussions. So we've done a great job in Maine um, keeping our COVID rates low. And that's why we're having this discussion is that we can. Um, we all play a role in keeping these rates low. Um, if we decide to open up schools and have more in-person exposure, we need to realize that we can't open up everything and expect, expect rates to remain low. You know, this, the conversation that's happening right now about interscholastic sports, um, uh, club sports, uh, these are all of these interactions for children um, have a potential for rising um, exposures and rising um, uh, COVID rates. And so we, we need to be aware that um, we need, need to advocate um, uh, for that which we would like to, which uh, for me, I'm very focused on opening schools and, and the economy right now. But if we're gonna open schools, we need to make that a priority. Um, I think in in communities like uh, LA or other communities where community where COVID rates are higher, distance learning is the most prudent at this point. Um, and I, I also want families to to realize to consider themselves um, as a, in a community agreement with one another when we send our children to school. Um, you know, it it means that you know for for me and my children who are going to in dis, in person learning this fall. Um, I'm not going to go visit my father-in-law's 80th birthday, you know, in Boston. That's not going to happen. So um, we all have to make uh, the commitment to having a healthiest community um, as possible by altering our personal decisions this fall. Um, I've been very sad that to, to not see the resources come for schools. Um, the AAP is strongly continuing to strongly advocate at, at the federal level. Um, and at the state level for the resources that will allow schools to achieve the safety standards that we um, are expecting as parents. Um, so we will continue to, to work uh, and advocate on those resources. Um, I, I think it, it's really important to realize that if we go to a hybrid or a distance learning model, it's not available to all, either because there aren't, there isn't high-speed internet, there's no computer or iPad that, is, that a family can use, there's no in-home support for children from the family <laughs> that they need to learn, and I think not all learning can, is possible to be done from a distance model. Um, as, as many of us know, children require um, different sorts of supports that just can't be done over Zoom. Um, pub the public health requirements that have come out from DOE are not re are requirements. Uh, sorry, I didn't, I have a not requirements here. Please strike not requirements. The public health requirements are requirements. They're not options, right? So this is not a sushi bar. We don't choose what we want. Uh, um, we actually need to know, we know that when we layer all of these mitigation measures together that they can work. Um, that's, you know, the health screenings at home, facial coverings in some way, shape or form physical distancing and short exposures between children and um, individuals, having small stable cohorts in school so that when there is an exposure in the cohort, that cohort can switch to distance learning while the rest of the school can maintain in-person operations. 
the hygiene that's responsible for keeping hands clean, um, ventilation, increasing ventilation, and testing if that becomes an option for schools. Interestingly, LA Unified, um, the second largest school district in, in the nation, has decided that they're going to develop their own um, testing abilities. Um, so they're not going to be relying on um, public health and, and the medical community for testing. So um, we're seeing testing become an increasing part of school openings. Um, and, and I think it's important uh, for everyone to hear uh, that despite the, uh, these, these recommendations or these options for how to open schools, that not all schools can and should open at this time. Uh, not all schools can do all of these things. And in-person education, like, uh, similarly, is not appropriate for all individuals at this time. And I think that's where we've, we all find ourselves, right? Is, are we the people that should, are we the schools that should open? Are we the people that should be sending our kids um, to uh, in-person learning? And I think that's where a lot of the questions lie. And so uh, lastly, you know, it's not a time for one size fits all, fits all and that's why I think I've, I'm here to speak with you guys today um, to talk a little bit about what are the, what are the caveats. I um, just want people to know that Maine AAP is here. Um, we're a trusted partner and resources uh, resource for you. We are prepared to help schools and families um, as we move through this pandemic and um, we're here um, for questions and concerns on our website. You can ask um, for any uh, the, you know, look at the resources that we have for parents and schools and um, if there's anything that we can do in terms of supporting uh, families um, and schools at, at this time, um, we are here. Um, so I'm going to stop my screen share and Carrie, I'm going to ask you um, what, uh, what are we hearing from the chat box? What do people want to want to talk about? Okay, so the first question I've got um, is, do you know anything about a pot potential saliva test so testing could be universal? Um, so the, I think the question is about pooled, um, pooled testing, perhaps. Um, so, so there is saliva testing currently for individuals um, that uh, it, saliva is just another way to obtain a sample that doesn't require a swab. So um, we, might have, we might have heard about supply chain issues in terms of testing um, and the swab is one of the supplies that we need um, to do testing. So there have been um, various individuals that first came out of Rutgers um, that have looked at saliva as an ability to obtain a sample without a swab. So we don't need to worry about that supply chain. Um, so the saliva tests are great. They look like they're functioning in the, in, um, the same uh, you know, testing um, validity as, as the swabs. Um, the pooled testing might be what um, individuals are talking about. And that's where we use um, a sample from a handful of individuals, say five individuals are tested on one test run. Um, and this is an attempt to move from testing symptomatic individuals, people with symptoms, to testing asymptomatic individuals. And that's the screening um, that we're that we're looking to do in you know can the congregate and community settings, so um, those are coming out um, and I think uh, you know the, that's the kind of every day we're learning something new. But I do I do um, feel hopeful that there there will be more cost effective and uh, screening opportunities coming soon. I don't I don't believe that it's going to be available um, before September, um, but um, I do believe that those things are coming out as people are trying to move back into these uh, into the school setting. Is the fidelity of the saliva testing as um, reliable as the fidelity of the nasal swab? Yes, actually, if we look at testing, um, some testing data from adults, um, it looks like it's actually better. Um, it's a larger sample. Um, and so there, we're still running. So there are three types of tests now available on the market. There's the um, antibody tests, so that, that's the immunity test, which we don't think play a role all that much in, in, um, in schools or in um, in it's a 50-50 test at this point. Um, there's the rapid test um, that is the one that comes back in 15 minutes, much like a rapid strep. Um, those tests are only to be used for individuals who are symptomatic. And then there's this PCR test. It's the nasal swab test. Um, and the PCR looks for the, the um, DNA uh, or the, the DNA component of the, the virus. It's actually RNA, but um, the genetic material of the virus. And um, the saliva test is, is, a, is that R, that genetic genetic material test, and it does look like it's performing quite well. 
Do you, as a pediatrician, feel like you have access to testing? So when a child is um, coming in with symptoms that, uh, I mean, I know it's been, it, the, the availability of testing has been up and down and up and down. I feel like it's been a little bit of a roller coaster ride right now. Where do you feel like the availability for testing is as, as a pediatrician in the state of Maine? Yes, I feel like we're at a point now where the testing is available um, for, for individuals. Now, the, I think the caveat to that is when do you get your test result back? So I can test almost anyone. Um, it's, it's just that various labs have various turnaround times. The larger labs, Quest, LabCorp, you, there was a lot of press in the last couple of weeks when we saw that peak at the end of July um, that they were just um, running out of of sample uh, time um, in, in the supply chain. So there was up to 10 days till we get a test back. Um, but now we're seeing those, um, those come back down and a lot of um, the physician's offices are, are the either Maine Health or Northern Light or many of the uh, um, healthcare systems in Maine have purchased their own testing capabilities. So we're seeing that, that time to results uh, come down as well. Great. Um, can you speak a little bit about transmission of the virus from surfaces? Yeah, um, so I think it's really important. One takeaway message um, is that this is primarily a respiratorily spread virus. So this comes from droplets from the mouth that go into the nasal passages on the, the, the conjunctiva of the eyes or into the mouth of other individuals. Um, we have data about in the lab about if you take a sample of coronavirus and you put it on various um, items, can you um, isolate the, va the virus and how long does it last on each um, sample? But that's a lab. You know, that, that is a, a large inoculum of it in the lab that they used um, and, and, um, and it, it is in the lab setting. Uh, so I, I think that what I try to tell people in, in the sort of environments like schools or other areas are these are the most important things to protect. <laughs> If, if a virus does survive on a surface, it only gets to your nasal passage or your kid's nasal passage if they touch things and then they inoculate themselves or they rub their eyes. So if we can do frequent hand washing, you know, Anthony Fauci, Dr. Fauci washes his hands 40 times a day. And that's what I'm, I'm encouraging my kids. Oh. <laughs> you. We get, we, yeah. we maybe get to 15, you know, right? All right. Don't let, don't mm -hmm. let perfect be the enemy of good. Um, but it, if we can protect our hands, then we can really um, worry less about the surfaces. So anytime I, um, yesterday I went out, uh, I got takeout. You know, I, I grabbed the bag, I put it in the car, I washed my hands, I drove my car, I grabbed the bag, I went into the house, I washed my hands, and I prepared dinner. So uh, this sort of gel in, gel out idea of any sort of touching of surfaces is going to really help us. And we saw that in the camp setting this summer where we had a lot less communicable disease in general, um, just because of the increased Purell or, or hand washing. Yeah. Um, so for children and adolescents who have anxiety disorders, what are your recommendations for their care teams on how to support their transition into the school year? Um, I, I, the, this is a, a, a really critical issue this year. Um, I, I, the pediatricians are, are trying to um, hook children into the services that they need to support them. Um, I think it did, yeah, on a, on a, uh, each child has their own individual anxieties and worries, but I would, I would try to um, speak to your primary care doctor if, if those worries are getting um, to a place of paralysis or affecting the you know, daily, daily life of these children. But I think for the most part, um, I really have been trying to talk to children about just hearing them hearing their fears. Um, you know, with the, the summer camp that my husband um, runs and I, I, I was the medical staff on, I found that kids didn't get a chance to have their voice heard. And once they heard, had their, their voice heard and, and acknowledging their anxieties, that, that kind of took it down a notch. But for those children who, are, who have you know, clinically diagnosed anxiety disorders or um, issues like that, I would say to work with your, call your, your primary care doctor or their therapist or psychiatrist and create a plan of attack. There are lots of great resources out there for kids right now. And I would also encourage um, 
parents uh, to work with your school districts if you have an anxiety disorder and you have an IEP and a 504 plan to really work that individualized program or 504 plan to meet the needs of your child. And I know most districts are offering a virtual, 100% virtual option um, for students in returning back. And while that might not always be available to students, I have heard that those students with an anxiety disorders this spring actually did, were able to perform better because they didn't have the anxiety about being in a social setting with schools. Um, mm -hmm. That that doesn't mean that should be the only option for you, but to explore those options and to always ask for what you need. I think the one thing we learned from the disability rights um, webinar we did on Monday of this week is you don't get what you don't ask for. Um, and so collect the data and bring them into your school district and work with your primary care physician or any other counselors or specialists, doctors that you're working with to use them to write notes or get data from them as to what might be the best fit when asking for your school district. So now's the time to ask. Um, Moving on to the next question. There's a lot of talk about waiting for the vaccine for COVID, but are vaccines being tested on children or just healthy adults? Does that mean when a vaccine does come out for COVID, it won't have been tested on children and will we be, will we be providing it to children? Great questions. So, um, you know, this, this year has seen uh, an unprecedented number of vaccines being developed with an unprecedented number of scientific expertise. Typically, <clears throat> We have one group that's developing a vaccine and it takes you know five to ten years to develop. We have 70 uh, groups who have put forth an effort to develop vaccines. Um, we now have a good handful, seven to ten I would say, that have looked promising um, as they come out of the phase one to phase two trials. Phase one trials are the ones where we um, look to see if the vaccine actually works, can actually do generate immune response. Phase two trials are those trials where we look to see what dose is most effective because we never want to give more than we need. Um, so those phase two trials are the ones that have been happening over the course of the summer and into the fall. And several vaccines have made it out of those trials into phase three trials. Phase three trials are where we give the vaccine to healthy volunteers and look to make sure that the vaccine does what we thought it would do and doesn't do anything that we, we hoped it wouldn't do. Um, so we're heading into phase three trials now and we're getting, um, I, I'm really looking forward to the data from phase three trials. It's hard for me as a scientist and a pediatrician to say anything about any vaccine until I've seen robust phase three data. Um, uh, whenever we use vaccines in various age groups, we test them in those age groups. So these, these vaccines will be tested in any individual that they're indicated for. Um, and um, so yes, when it does comes out, come out, it will be tested um, in both healthy adults and healthy children volunteers. Um, I think it's it's very um, important. Also, I think is that because of the um, worldwide pandemic that we're in, this vaccine is going to be used in a lot of individuals over a rapid period of time. Typically, when we watch a vaccine come out, we watch post-market you know, um, performance um, and side effects. And it usually takes a long time to get to a million doses um, to really understand the vaccine side, post-market um, side effects, wow. if there are any. And you can imagine we're gonna get to a million doses very quickly of any vaccine that comes out. So I'm really hoping and I feel very hopeful that we'll understand the side, side effect profile of vaccines very quickly as they come out for COVID. Great, thank you. Um, the cases that Dr. Shaw reports on on a daily basis, are the numbers you're reporting all labs or just the state funded labs? They're all labs. So um, because okay. uh, COVID is a, a mandatory reported disease, any lab that present, prevent um, has a positive in Maine or anywhere in the U.S., for instance, um, you know, if you had a positive, uh, if you went to the Outer Banks and then test, were tested there and had a positive, but you resided in Maine, that positive test would come back and it would be reported by Dr. Shaw. Okay, great. Thank you. How effective is hand sanitizer versus hand washing when hand washing is not always available? Um, hand sanitizer is great. Um, if it's above, you know, 60% ethyl, uh, there's a couple of different kinds of alcohols. But if it, if it has the appropriate level of, of um, alcohol in it, hand sanitizer is wonderful. Um, I do, um, I did a little uh, teaching session for the kids at camp this summer. I think it's important. It, you can't just... <laughs> 
you could do that. I mean, it's really important to rub it, to get it all over, to get your fingers, to get your wrists, to get around your thumbs. So when it's when it's applied appropriately, it's it's very very effective. This virus is not all that strong uh, when it when it's um, when with any kind of house common household cleaner, including dish soap. This this virus does not survive very easily. So um, hand washing and Purell are the same. Or I, sorry, I shouldn't say Prell. I don't own stock in Prell. <laughs> hand sanitizer, um, hand sanitizer um, is the same as long as it has an appropriate alcohol content. And I just want parents to be aware that there have been some recalls on various hand sanitizers. Um, so just to to kind of keep up to date, um, if you're purchasing large amounts of hand sanitizer, keep up to date about the recalls. What about um, hand sanitizer for kids who put their hands in their mouth consistently? Oh yeah. Um, I think it would, I would want to look at the product. Um, that's a really great question. Um, I haven't been asked yet. Um, I would, I'm going to look, I'm going to look at um, poison control. I'm going to call poison control and ask them what they would say about that. I, if you can wash those individual, those kids' hands, that would probably be better, you know, for kids who, who have their hands in their mouth a lot. Um, but let me get back to you on that, Carrie. That's an excellent yeah. Thanks. Yeah. And we'll post it on our um, Facebook page when, when um, we hear back from you on that. So thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, I work in schools and I am fearful just like every, I'm fearful just like everyone else is. Are you saying that once we are back in school and are around kids and other staff, we should avoid our personal family gatherings, which we also follow safety guidelines for? Thank you. Um, I, I, I think what, what I'm saying is that we need to be aware um, as a community about choosing low risk activities um, when our children are in school. I, I wouldn't say for me personally, um, and we each need to make our own personal decisions, I, I'm not going to go to a wedding with 100 people uh, when my children are in school. I, I'm not going to um, go to a, not that I'm a big raver, <laughs> but I wouldn't go to a large party at this point. I, I'm going to use my mask. I'm going to use hand sanitizer. I'm going to stay physically distanced from individuals. I have um, very good friends and neighbors who take care of my children, one who's 80, um, and I'm not going to have my children interacting with them. So being socially responsible about our behaviors, I think we all understand what those are. Um, and um, uh, and we have to just realize that we need to temper our, our behaviors while our children are in school, understanding that they're going to have exposures um, that they bring home to us. And we are going to have to be very mindful of the exposures that we're going to give to our children when they go into a community environment. Thanks. Um, what should parents and teachers tell young students about the virus? Um, so I would say I would say these are school age children, right? So you know, yeah. I mean, it's going to be pre K, right? I mean, pre K through twelve. So every you know, you yeah. have different conversations with different age groups. Yeah, um, and I think so the hardest the hardest probably is the youngest group is that you know we're trying yeah. to what do we say to a five year old you know who says mm. what's going on what is this virus you know and and I think you know being very concrete and and not um, and letting the child do. Um, the child direct the conversation, I think is probably what I would uh, say is, is that, you know, I find that oftentimes kids who are five or six, they're asking a question, we, oh, we put an emotional overlay on the question that they're asking us and try to answer it from an adult perspective, when honestly, they're just asking, if I wash my hands, will I be safe? <laughs> So, um, and so you can answer the question that they're asking you and, um, you know, and I think it's, I think it's appropriate to let kids at that age know that, that there are a lot of adults who are, who are paying attention to, to work to keep them safe. Um, and, and so I guess I would, uh, I would follow the kids questions. Um, healthychildren.com has a lot of resources about talking to children at different age groups. So that's the American Academy of Pediatrics um, parent um, education site, healthychildren.com. Com. And uh, so I would direct people there for, for more specific guidance about um, how to approach children. Um, and every child's different, right? Um, some children, my, I have kids who are like, whatever, mom, <laughs> just tell me what I, where I'm going today. And then there are kids who, are, who have many more worries and questions. 
Yeah, um, I would say for our own family, um, my daughter who's 13 and has Down syndrome but has um, higher anxieties, um, which have really shown themselves as she's actually approached the age of puberty. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of hormonal imbalances there. Um, and when talking with her, it's, um, you know, when she asks a question, it will be, it's because of the virus, it's to keep you healthy. And trying to understand what her level of understanding is going to be without increasing her anxieties about going back to school. Um, and then letting her know that mom and dad are the adults and we're, we're watching and worrying about what we need to, to try to keep her safe. Um, and then, you know, my 15 year old son, who's a sophomore um, in high school, it's a much different conversation because it's a much higher level of understanding and learning. But the other thing we try to do is keep the news to a minimum level in our house. Like <laughs> We try to- Thank you, I was gonna say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the media that we bring into our house can really affect our children in ways that we don't, um, we don't even realize. Um, I right. realize that I was, this past spring, I don't know about you, Gary, but I was watching a lot of news hour and my children, were starting to become more anxious. And so I decided that I would watch that at night <laughs> after they were yeah. asleep. Yeah, and they pick up and, and understand. We, we were having the conversation earlier that, that we don't oftentimes give them enough credit for understanding. So um, I think it's great advice to ask or answer the direct question that they're asking. And a lot of times we might embellish and that's not what they need or want. Um, is the AAP working with CDC to make recommendations when a student or staff does test positive? Our district doesn't have a clear plan except to follow CDC guidelines. Yeah, the, the American Academy, Maine AAP has been working closely with CDC um, uh, to, to um, and, and school physicians and school nurses um, to talk about the guidelines that schools need. Um, and so we've been meeting uh, weekly for the last uh, three or four months. Um, and so yes, the answer is yes. And if there are decision trees that parents are finding that they, they don't have, please do let myself or Dr. Hagler, who's the president of the main AAP know, we can try to um, uh, get those answers. So we're, you know, we are developing new communication lines. Um, and this is this, the reopening of school um, is a communication between the CDC, um, the schools and the primary care providers and parents. So there's there are all of these various communication lines that we need to recreate or, or create. And so um, if there is a case in a school, we are working on how does that go up in communication to the CDC? And then how does the CDC communicate that down to schools and parents? And what's the role of the pediatrician or the, the care provider in that? So we're working on that now and, and um, with, with the CDC closely. Great. Um, primary care doctors have suggested they are not going to write letters related to not wearing a mask due to their disability. What would you suggest in that situation? Um, so um, I think there's a there's a couple of comments I'd like to make about that. First of all, um, is that you know not all kids are the same. So um, we're going to have to take this on a case by case basis. Uh, I have found that um, kids are incredibly capable um, in, and that many kids who I thought couldn't do something actually ended up doing it. So and we had a lot of kids at camp who were, you know, um, normally developing children who, who were very anxious about wearing masks and they ended up being quite fine doing it. I also do realize that there are children who won't wear masks, who can't wear masks and it's not gonna happen. So I, I, uh, Carrie and I spoke a little bit about this before um, and I, I think the best recommendations are to, if, you're, if your child is a child who has various care givers in, in terms of um, you have you know, genetics or um, cardiology in addition to your pediat pediatrician, you know, having a conversation with each of them about what, what your child um, should and can be able to do in school. I think it's also important to have a conversation with the school and say in in saying, okay, what what are the various options that that we can put into place um, for my child? What pediatricians are finding is that um, many individuals are approaching us saying, my child just can't wear a mask, and there there isn't any developmental or behavioral or medical reason that that child cannot. It's a normally developing individual. And so we're trying to say to families, let's, let's do some mass desensitization, let's practice, let's make it normal, let's make it fun, let's try all those things. And if those things fail, let's, let's have another conversation. Um, I think additionally advocating with the school and partnering with the school in terms of you know, what you feel like your child 
um, should have in terms of options. Carrie was talking a little bit about the options that she's put forth for her children, um, masking being one, but then having an opportunity to wear a face shield if the masking um, becomes untenable at any point in during the, the school day. Um, schools are going to have to figure out um, how to provide services with children who won't wear masks, and that that is another um, you know, policy and procedure uh, that I have enc been encouraging schools to figure out because there are some children who just won't won't wear masks. It's somewhat somewhat similar to the daycare guidance that we've put forth, um, which you know we just know a one year old is not supposed to wear a mask, so we'll just change the environment around that individual to make sure it's safe for those who are who are yeah. in proximity. Yeah, and we had a, a long conversation about this as well on our webinar on um, Monday with Disability Rights Maine, which is recorded and um, will be up on our website by the end of the day today, um, but it's also on our Facebook Live page. So you can refer to that as well in regards to what Ben and Atlee had um, as advice for parents. But I think, um, you know, a couple different things, you know, you don't get what you don't ask for from a school district. So um, make sure you're working that 504 and IEP plan to meet the needs of your child. And if your child's not going to wear a mask and and um, has the right to a free and appropriate public education, like all other children, what are the alternatives available um, for your specific child? And then, um, like Dr. Laura said, work with all of your doctors. Um, a lot of our children have many different doctors because of their special needs. So the primary care physician might actually not be the best fit to get the letter from because they might not be able to speak to the specific behaviors your child is experiencing. So um, look to um, the available doctors, whether they be behavior doctors that you're working with, genetic specialists, cardiologists, so on and so forth. Um, the primary care physician is not the only road to go down to get a letter. Um, what do you know about how long a person maintains antibodies after having the infection? Um, I'm going to get to that in just a minute. Um, Timothy Sear asked a question about as a therapist. I think it's a, follow, a great follow-up question to the, the question we just had about So if you're providing that close hand-over-hand -hand physical guidance um, in therapy sessions, I think mm -hmm. the, the, if you look at the DOE guidance, we're, we're really thinking those individuals should be maximally protected. Um, the PPE that we use in, in the medical field um, and or in the dentist field uh, is the type of PPE that we would be thinking about for people who um, say a child couldn't wear a mask and you needed to provide mm -hmm. therapy to that individual. I would ask you to protect yourself with a surgical mask and a, a face covering and eye, sh eye, you know, either goggles or a face shield. Um, and then, you know, gloves aren't necessary as long as we wash our hands before and after we're touching an individual. So maximal protection for those, uh, those individuals. So in terms of antibodies, um, you know, we are learning uh, a lot more about antibodies. You know, the, this, um, this disease has been, you know, in circulation probably since last November. Um, and so we don't even have a year's worth of data. And us uh, scientific people are folks who will only tell you the data if we have it. <laughs> so so um, I, I think we can say that, you know, it looks like people are developing a normal immune response to coronavirus. And we have about nine months, eight months of data to tell you that their antibodies are seemingly keeping them safe for, the, for these eight months that we've known this disease. Um, it's, it's good news that we're seeing the, the normal immune response um, because we would hope that um, the normal immune response that we all make to viruses um, will keep us, keep us safe. Certainly in, in the short term, we know that antibodies do wane over the lifetime of a person, but um, stay tuned. <laughs> Every month we know a little bit more about how yeah. long those antibodies last. This is true. Um, what would you recommend for mass brace at, sc at school? How many and for how long? Yeah, so mask breaks is something that we've we've um, we've talked about, and and whether or not we need to call it a mask break, um, you know, that's that's assuming that we all just need a break from our masks, and they're just so impossible to wear all the time that we need a break. I like to think about schools developing an environment where kids don't have to wear masks all the time. And, and that, that means that when you're on the playground six feet away from other individuals, why don't you take off your mask and have a good time? Um, when we're eating, we can't wear masks. So let's create an environment where we can take off our masks and have a meal and be safe and physically distanced from other individuals. So I don't believe that there is a concept of a mask break. Um, I think that there is a concept of 
de designing a day so that we're not just putting kids in masks and leaving them there. As, as I, that's what I worry about. I worry about um, us not paying attention to the fact that we've put a child out with a mask and they're sitting there compliantly with their mask on under their culture of compliance. And we're not thinking, oh, do you really need to have your mask on right now? So um, that, that is what I'm encouraging um, in terms of for educators and, and school administrators and school nurses is to think about times when children don't have to wear masks throughout the day. Can you speak to the transmission from children so they pick up COVID at a preschool to adults at home? The transmission rates? Yeah, from children that, to adults. Yeah. Yeah. So um, <laughs> the the we're we're learning more and more um, as we go along. So initially, so, uh, there was research that showed that um, that it didn't look like children were good transmitters of the virus to adults. It looked like when we when we modeled, you know, in in some of the data that was coming out of China, when we modeled. Um, uh, that children should have had more exposures and should have been infecting more in individuals than than they did. Um, so, so that has been the general the general thought about coronavirus. For some reason, children just don't you know make a lot of virus and don't um, transmit it very well. Um, I want to say an asterisk to that is that up until just about four weeks ago, a lot of children hadn't had coronavirus. We had seen the coronavirus in the older age groups. We saw it moving down into the kind of the younger individuals. And now we've seen, you know, a uh, hundred percent increase in children having COVID in the last, you know, four weeks. And so we, we need to do some analysis of the data now that children have had coronavirus, um, whether or not we see outbreaks happening um, that are coming from children. One thing that's um, uh, reassuring to me is that, you know, a lot of daycares have been open as essential um, businesses and essential services. And you, one would expect the daycare outbreaks to be a lot higher um, if it were the children um, that were transmitting the virus. Um, and when we've looked at several of the daycare outbreaks, it looks like it's the adults passing the virus to the children. But again, the epidemiology right now is changing. Um, and so I, 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 would, I would say that I'm, I'm not going to say that children don't transmit the virus, but up until this point, it looks like they're not terrific transmitters. Um, you had talked about mass breaks. You had talked about students being six feet apart could um, take off their mask. But I think you were referencing if they were outside and six feet apart, they could take their masks off. So if they're inside and six feet apart, you would still recommend masks on. That's correct. Okay. Um, uh, this is the first I've heard of the pool testing. Would this look like testing the stable cohorts in one group, or could it be as large as an entire school? Are you optimistic about this option? Um. Yes, so it could it could be that you're just testing the cohorts of your uh, or, or the school could choose that they're going to randomly test cohorts of the entire school district. Um, it's unclear about, you know, the, the um, about the, the practice of that at this point, but I am optimistic. I mean, we need to, as a society, come up with a way that we can screen for um, the presence of this virus, particularly as a pediatrician and in children who up to 50% of children have no symptoms. So we, we need to, there, there is no, there's going to be um, very few ways to keep, to mitigate the spread of this virus that's silent in children for, the, for, a, for a great number of children without having some sort of screening ability. Um, you know, in, in all of my other years of public health practice, you know, H1N1, for instance, came out in 2009. Children were horribly sick with that disease. And so it was never a confusing picture about whether a child had the disease or did not. And it made it, you know, that's classically how we work in epidemiology and public health, is that we identify the cases, the cases aren't hard to identify. Um, and so I, I do feel like um, the public health community is aware that we need to find a good screening strategy. And I'm really looking forward to this pool testing as an opportunity to screen uh, cohorts of individuals. Um, um, of course, we'll probably perfect it right about the time we have an effective vaccine. Scene, but <laughs> but we're doing our best. We're all yeah, running on all cylinders. Yeah, we've we've never done this before. Um, I do psychological assessments with children, and I'm in a room with one child for up to two hours. Any special masks, like an N95 or PPA, PPE, we need to use. We're both talking throughout the time, and may only be three or four feet apart. 
Yeah. So um, I think up until this point, we've been um, reticent to recommend uh, N95s for individuals outside the medical setting um, because for a couple of reasons. One, they have been um, extremely limited, um, but they've been difficult to obtain. Um, uh, and we needed them for our healthcare providers who are in the rooms with positive COVID um, individuals. Um, and also in order to properly use an N95, you need to be fit tested. It has to be fit to your face and you have to go through this process of fit testing. Um, I, I, I think that we're going to see a, as supplies stabilize and uh, that we will be recommending uh, N95s for those closer individuals in the future. At this, at this time, um, you know, I, you know, when I see patients, any patient, I'm wearing a surgical mask and eye coverings. And so at this point, that is what we're recommending for in people outside the medical community who are not dealing with COVID positive individuals. Is there possibly a difference in transmission by children depending on age, younger versus older? We are seeing that the, the data that's coming out each week is uh, changing, but we are seeing that older, older children, 16, 17, 18, are behaving epidemiologically much more like adults. So yes, um, you know, children less than 10, a study that just came out, um, well, what's just three weeks ago, so it's probably old, <laughs> an old study three weeks ago uh, from, from China demonstrated that children less than 10 um, seem to transmit to statistically less than likely than children over 10. So that currently is what we're using as our, our kind of benchmark is that children over 10 seem to transmit similarly to young adults and children less than 10 seem to transmit similarly you know, in a decreased fashion. Um, recent, da recent data suggests that face shields are better than nothing, but nowhere as effective as face coverings. If children are in school wearing just face shields, does that put other kids or staff at risk? I also wonder if functional life skills students um, that cannot tolerate, face ca cannot tolerate face coverings can safely access mainstream classrooms. So the face shield, face covering uh, debate continues. Um, unfortunately, we don't have great data um, to, to, to say, to, you know, for sure that face coverings, uh, face shields are, are not effective. Um, but I, I think I just want to back up and help people think about, about how we attend public school safely. So there are at least seven or eight layers of protection that we're putting into place. Um, there's health screenings, daily health screenings. There's physical distancing, there's face coverings, there's um, uh, ventilation, there's cohorting, there's you know, having the community rates that we do. So there, there are many, many layers that we're putting into place in terms of, of keeping each other safe. And face coverings is one, just like testing is one, just like screening is one, but they only work when you layer them on top of each other. And when one needs to be taken out for any given reason, whether it's physical distancing because we need to move in close to a student for a quick moment to do a correction um, and then step back, or whether it's taking off a face covering for, for a moment to eat and putting it back on. We need to ensure that we have a, the, the robust other layers that we put into place are in place and they're diligently used. So um, at this point, going back to the question, if a child cannot wear a face mask, we, we are now said, we have now said in, in the public health guidance that they may use a face shield. The face shield needs to be, you know, down. It, it, it can't be, you know, these, I was at Walmart the other day and I saw this, this face shield that was about like the size of this big. <laughs> um, that's not acceptable. Um, but so they need, it needs to be a great, a good face shield. Um, and so that's acceptable at this time. Um, and we will, we will be updating that data as, as we get data out. But to remind folks that it's not just the face Covering, you know, it, it is all of the aspects that we're doing that, that provide decreased transmission in schools. And then the mainstream classroom environment, um, we had a conversation right before coming on about, about this question about creating the cohorts that we're creating. Um, and um, it's important to have these smaller cohorts from a medical standpoint. Um, but there's also been red flags raised about um, recreating silos for special needs kids as we create these cohorts and their inability to access the mainstream population. 
Um, it's definitely something that um, Maine Parent Federation as the Parent Training and Information Center for the state of Maine has been watching closely and ra raising red flags. I do know that Erin um, Frazier from the Department of Education has told all of our special ed directors to do their best possible not to create um, segregation within the special needs population. So if your child was accessing the mainstream population prior, Maine Parent Federation is recommending that within your individualized education programs, in your meetings with your schools, to develop a plan in which your child can still safely access that mainstream population. So for some children, it might be they're doing it virtually, and the school has the ability to do it virtually. For others, it may be that you're put in a cohort with the mainstream population, and you're receiving your special education in a push-in model in which the teacher is coming to the student as opposed to the student going to the mainstream population or traveling to the teacher. So those are individualized conversations that we would um, absolutely recommend you having. Um, but we also understand that this decision for family members or for families of children who have special needs who are also compromised is a very personal one and a very difficult one because you really, really need that in-person learning. I, as a parent myself, I understand how much more precious that in-person learning is versus the virtual learning, but you're really concerned about exposing your children. So it's a very individualized decision. And if you decide to put your children in a cohort that is going to be mainly with special needs kids so that your child can get that in-person learning and you feel that that's the better option, that is absolutely your decision. We respect that. We just want to make you aware of the fact that when you, when this emergency is over at some point in time and you want to go back to getting access to that mainstream population, what ends up happening is that silo has become your child's least restrictive environment and it might be difficult to get that change of placement back into the mainstream population. So in making that decision for your child, just make sure that you have all the information and, and you take it all to, into account. And we spoke about this at length again to um, on our conversation with Disability Rights Maine. Um, so if that's something you want to access, you can go back and access that webinar and I'll let um, Dr. Lara as well speak to that because we did have a long conversation. Yeah. Sorry, I'm, I was trying to answer some of the Q&A questions while, <laughs> while you were talking, but um, I, I'm going to leave it at, at what you said, Carrie. Okay, I great. think you said it well, and, um, you know, uh, I think, you know, I was just answering a question about cohorting and what that means, and, you know, what were, I think for me, it's the least appreciated of the public health interventions out there, um, but because, um, you know, we will inevitably have children with fevers. We will inevitably have children perhaps with COVID in school. And when, when that happens, we need to figure out who that child was an exposure to and manage those individuals. And they'll probably be quarantined for 14 days and there's no way to get out of quarantine um, at this point in terms of testing. So we need to anticipate that these things are going to happen. And when we do anticipate that, we realize that cohorting plays such an important role in keeping the operation of school going and in keeping the operation of learning going. So if you can take an entire classroom and move them, um, quarantine them at home and keep their distance learning going and when they're done with their quarantine they can come back in. Um, that, that is the, the, the merits of cohorting. One, it decreases, it puts up walls around the spread of a disease, but it also allows schools continue and, and other child care, you know, and child facilities to continue operating um, while providing that early identification and isolation of cases and quarantine of potentially exposed individuals. Yeah, so but, it's a tricky situation for a special needs kids. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. Um, we, we don't want to um, use it uh, recklessly. Right, yes. So yeah, it's a very, because cohorting is the best model medically um, for, for this virus, but it might not be the best model, model for our special needs students, in, which is why it should really be an individualized decision. Correct. Um, for your families. Um, are there any new protocols and considerations to have in mind as we get into the cold, colder months and facing colds and flus? Oh, that is like the pediatrician's nightmare right there. <laughs> um, you know, um, I'm an optimist, so I'll say um, I saw in the camp settings this summer um, we had just a decrease across the board in terms of communicable diseases based on these public health inter you know interventions that we put into place. So perhaps we'll see less transmission of flu and common colds. Um, but I know that as a pediatrician, I'm uh, and we know as pediatricians that we are going to be treating everything like it's COVID unless we unless proven otherwise. So you will see a lot more testing um, this, this 
uh, winter as we head into the cough and cold season. Um, coronavirus has proven in children to be the great mimicker. It can be a runny nose, it can be a sore throat, um, and we have created protocols um, on the pediatric side about who we will be testing, who we will be monitoring for 24 hours. Um, but I think uh, from, a, from, a, from a parent's perspective, you'll see that we will be ruling out COVID and flu likely together and trying to find other diagnoses for fevers. Um, and hopefully, you know, it's never been positive to have strep throat, but maybe that this will be the year that if you have strep throat, it's a good thing. You know, it's a good cause for your fever. <laughs> So, I mean, it's sort of the next question segues into it well, and you, you probably answered most of it, but do you have any other thoughts on where we're going to be able to draw the line and what would, could be COVID symptoms versus what's going to be a typical childhood illness? Um, I, no. <laughs> I, I mean, it's so difficult. It's so, so difficult to do as a, as a physician, a pediatrician right now. I think first in my mind, when I see a child with a symptom, I think couldn't can this be COVID? Could I make this COVID? Um, and uh, if if the answer is yes, possibly, I've seen a you know a case of that, or that's been reported to just present with that symptom. Um, you know, uh, children are more likely to present with gastroenteritis or you know vomiting and diarrhea from COVID than they are um, adults. Um, we're just treating that and testing and making sure um, that it's not coronavirus. If you know, for instance, I had a kid this summer who um, had um, classic UTI symptoms, right? He was going to the bathroom frequently and had a fever. I was never so happy to see a positive urine culture in my life. And I did not, I did test him for coronavirus just to be sure, um, but was happy to put him on antibiotics and, and watch him get better. So I'm going to sort of combine two mass questions. Um, one is, so the first part of it is if I'm using a disposable mask and I'm a therapist, so I'm working closely with students, how often should I change that mask, student to student or daily? And then are masks with filters better than masks without filters? Does it make a difference? Um, so, uh, you know, at, at medical facilities, we're given, we're, we're using one mask a day. So I'll use one mask for the entire day and throw it away at home um, just and wash my hands after I take it off. Um, the filtered masks, um, I, I don't, there's so many different kinds of masks right now. I, I don't know exactly what the filtered mask is, but we're not, I haven't seen any data that shows that the, a filter in the mask is better than any other mask. I think mostly it's, it's the tight fitting nature of the mask. It, you know, masks shouldn't be easy to breathe through. Um, and and uh, the, the Gator data that came out from Duke, mm -hmm. Uh, if you hold the, you know, if you hold the mask up and you can see light through it, it's not, it's not good. <laughs> um, so um, I, I don't think that the filters are probably any better than, you know, kind of the classic masks at this point. But again, we're still waiting for good data on all the various types of masking. I also saw a good test. Um, I think it was on the Today Show this morning um, in regards to if you can blow out a candle with your mask on, then it's not a good mask. <laughs> Like, start, like that's, that's another good test. Like the, That's a good candle. I like the yeah. candle test. I might steal yeah. that from you, Gary. Yeah. It was, I gotta, I'll give the Today Show credit for that one. Okay. Okay. Um, how would COVID-19 affect the vaccination laws in schools that was recently passed in Maine? No relation at this point. Um, I will say I did see on a website this morning that Massachusetts is requiring for in-person learning all their kids to have three vaccinations. So that's happening in Massachusetts. There's been nothing here in Maine that um, has been spoken about, but um, that might be where that question is coming from. I don't think it would affect the vaccination law per se, but Massachusetts is now saying that their kids to attend in person have to have the flu vaccine as well. Yeah. So that's just something to watch for nationally. And to, to be clear, the flu vaccine is not required. Um, right, um, not here in Maine. No, right, nope. Um, are masks that are a little bit okay for children to wear if there are open areas on the top or the bottom? Finding the right size fit is hard to find sometimes. Yeah, especially the young kids. Um, uh, I have found, I've gone through uh, many, many, many different types of masks as I've been trying to fit kids' faces. And, and increasingly, you're finding that they're, they're sizable. Um, I think it's also important to um, uh, look at the, there are little kind of toggles on the back of the ears um, so that you can you know, fit the mask differently. So if you're looking for like a cloth mask, you might look and see if they have the little kind of tighteners on the back of the ears. That's been helpful um, for kids. And then, you know, it might be a time to figure out 
how to put a dart, you know, in your kids in your kids masks. Um, uh, if you if you remember that from home ec of, in junior high, um, or finding somebody who can help you put a dart in to make sure that masks do fit fit children well. What should teachers that do in class support do before entering and exiting different classrooms? It's a good question. Yeah, so certainly wash in, wash out. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of the, you know, what that would look like. So you would hope that you would, you would move, um, you know, your, your ingress to a classroom would, you would be able to remain six feet from every individual as you move into that classroom and you could make a path and, and to the individual that you're supporting directly. Um, I think as long as, you know, close contacts in terms of the CDC. So if, if say there was a case in a classroom, it would be oh, that you would have to be yeah. with, uh, within six feet of an individual for um, greater than 15 minutes, whether you're masked or unmasked. So, um, you know, if, if, if a person who's going into classroom support can really try to avoid a longer than 15 minute um, uh, uh, six foot interaction with anybody else in the classroom. I think that would be a really wise um, way to move into the classroom. And of course, washing when you leave. Um, how early can we get the flu shot? <laughs> um, typically, it, it depends on each year, different, it depends on how the flu shot production has gone. I haven't heard any of any delays this year. In fact, there's been only increased attention at getting that done. Typically, you know, by the end of uh, August and early September, your um, healthcare providers will begin to have flu shot clinics and we'll start to see those in uh, widely available. And, you know, and even if, you know, even if it's not a year that you typically get a flu shot, one might decide to do that this year just so that it's one less thing that's causing a fever, you know. Um. Um, what about the observation of the youngers pre-K, especially around both overheating and food reactions while wearing masks? Um, is it, do you think, do you interpret that question to be that they would overheat because they have a mask on? Yes. Okay. Um, I haven't seen that. Um, in fact, uh, I have a very good colleague who runs a, a summer camp of, of, you know, I think he had 800 kids in Texas this summer, and they were wearing masks, um, and they had daycares who had masks um, in, you know, 100 degree heat and didn't see overheating. So I, I, um, I certainly, I would just generally watch kids for overheating, but I don't think the masking will contribute increasingly to that. Um, Food in our, you know, food allergies. Hopefully, we know. Um, I guess it get, maybe the question is whether you couldn't see oral swelling um, with a mask. Yeah, on. I mean, it, I haven't seen any clarity, but um, that or extended exposure to a food, maybe because you, you've got the mask on. And mask. I think, I think while I, my understanding of what's happening is during eating time and snacks, kids are going to be separated, um, taking the mask off, eating cleaning up and then putting the mask back on. The mask Correct. isn't going to be pulled up or down during eating time. Eating time is going to be a time with no mask. Correct. And then they, they all will need to properly wash prior to putting their mask back on and going back to their academic instruction. That is my understanding of how meals and snack times are going to work in school. Uh, do you have any recommendations for PPE, P, PPE for escorts and therapeutic holds beyond what safety care recommends? Um, I will say that Maine DOE did put out guidance, um, specific guidance and related to COVID-19 around um, restraint seclusion as well as toilet training during this pandemic. Um, I will try to find that and post it in the chat box um, prior to um, the webinar ending. Um, if I'm not able to do that, we will repost it on our Facebook page as well. Um, but there is specific guidance around restraint and seclusion and toilet training that came out of MDOE. Um, where do we draw the line on excluding children from school with common symptoms such as allergy symptoms and diarrhea when those could be COVID symptoms as well? Yep, we're, um, we're working actively with the school nurses, um, the pediatrics, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics and school nurses are working. Um, and we, we have currently have a decision tree um, 
but you know if if symptoms uh, if say a school nurse sees you know allergy symptoms might ask the family to get the child evaluated um, if the physician determines that there's a there's an ulterior diagnosis that is plausible um, for the symptoms that that the, the pediatrician will be writing a note for the family um, uh, and I think it's it's just a it again we're, we just please know that as as pediatricians we are aware that we are going to be over testing um, for lots of symptoms but we are also um, quite experienced in knowing if it walks like a duck it quacks like a duck it's probably a duck uh, and we're, we don't necessarily need to treat um, um, every cough uh, or every runny nose as if it's COVID but we will be thinking about that when we make our diagnosis. Uh, what are the most common symptoms, if symptomatic, that children are presenting with COVID? Um, kids, kids present with less fever. They present more, we've seen more kind of cough, uh, runny nose, and sore throat. And, the, and as I said before, the, the gastroenteritis, kind of the nausea, vomiting, has been a, a bigger component of COVID for, for younger kids. But again, a, a vast majority of them have been um, mildly or asymptomatic. I will say, just sort of um, doubling back to the last question, we we had, um, I can't remember what meeting I was on or attending, but there was questions about like a child who has just a, a constant dry cough because they have asthma and being assumed to be COVID because they have a cough. And I would say what you need to do is, is make sure that if your child has um, allergies or a constant cough or what, chronic cough or other reasons to be communicating that to your school so that they're not um, assuming that that's, um, you know, whether it be the school nurse or the teacher, but they're not assuming that's a COVID, system, COVID symptom. Um, but I would say that schools are gonna be overly conscious, especially at the beginning. Right, and, and if your child has asthma or allergies, this is a time to be very good on their control. So if you, you know, in, in other years, if you've used a controller med to help control their asthma, well, then this is definitely a year to use a controller med for their asthma. For me, as somebody with allergies, uh, this is the year where I'm on Zyrtec and Flonase, um, just to make sure that I know that, you know, kind of that runny nose or itchy eyes or sore throat is treatable with those um, allergy treatments as opposed to being COVID. And I did just find the guidance on restraint, and seclusion, and toileting from MDOE, so I just posted that in the chat box. Um, do you know if schools can demand that teachers or students can only return to school after having the COVID test? Um, so, can you, would you mind repeating that question, Carrie? Uh, yep. Hold on. I can find it again. Um, where did it go? It was, um, do you know if teachers are going to be demanded to have a COVID-19 test to return to school, I think? If school um, systems can demand that. I haven't mm -hmm. seen, you know, so I haven't seen um, any school level um, regulations around return. Um, I, I think that, you know, at this point, um, if you have symptoms that could be consistent with COVID, um, any anyone you know anyone from the state or from your PCP would recommend that you be tested. Um, and then if you are if you have been exposed to somebody who's COVID positive, um, I haven't seen any recommendations beyond quarantining and then testing if you become symptomatic. I think those, that's less of a. I haven't seen regulations from the school, but that's more of a, just what we do as what we do as individuals who are who are working in in communities right now. I'm concerned about low-income families that might not be able to afford the number or any of the masks required and don't have any ability to make or find homemade masks. If there are any provisions anywhere to help them, masks have become prohibitively expensive and not always even available. So I can answer this for you. MDOE has purchased enough masks and PPE for schools and districts for the next three months, and that includes masks available for students who will not be able to afford them. So MDOE has covered that cost and is sending those supplies to each school district. I would... Um, if, if you have a student that is in need or if you're a family that is in need to contact your local school district, those are supposed to be made available to you. Um, is main care going to cover multiple COVID tests if they become necessary? 
So I don't know the answer. Do you know the answer to that? I don't know the answer to that. But what I would suggest is that you contact Trista Collins. Um, she is the main educational liaison for Maine Care. And she would have the answer to that. And I can put her email address in um, the chat box when I get a minute. What if children sneeze while wearing their masks, being in school or a public place? If they sneeze into their masks? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. So if a mask gets dirty or wet, what's the protocol yeah. on having to change it? Yeah. A mask that's dirty or wet should be changed. Um, it's not effective if, if it's wet. Um, so um, this is kind of a sending an extra mask to school. And I think, as Carrie has mentioned, that, that schools will have extra masks um, available for, for children if their masks become dirty or wet. And if you're a family that, it, you know, it's not a financial burden, it's recommended to send your children with multiple masks um, or face shields, um, whatever they're, they're using to school because it's inevitably going to happen. Um, our schools are providing cloth masks for our students and will be laundered at the school at the end of each day. Good to know. Should each child wear the same designated mask each day or would it be okay to choose a different clean cloth mask the next day? In other words, so the school is supplying the cloth masks, they're laundering them at the end of every day. Should the child get the same mask they had the previous day when they come back to school or is it okay to get one of the laundered masks that another child might have been wearing previously? Um, a question I have not received before. Um, I think if the masks are washed appropriately with detergent, there shouldn't be any indication for, for the same mask. I think um, parents might feel more comfortable if they labeled a mask and, and had their same mask for their, for their child. But depending, you know, you have 10 children that you're washing masks for 200 that might not be practicable. But I don't, I, from an infectious perspective, if they're washed appropriately with amount, the correct temperature and the correct um, detergent, it, there shouldn't be any um, any transmission that I could, could think of from what I understand now of coronavirus. And the recommendations are to wash your mask after each school day, correct? Or masks? Yep, to, to have a clean mask each day. So, you know, I have, I have three for my children and we just kind of rotate them and then I wash them. Mm -hmm. And is washing um, with, you know, hot water and dish soap under a faucet okay, or should, would you recommend laundering them? That's fine. Okay. Nope, fine. Yeah. If a child or teacher has one symptom on the COVID list, should they stay home or is it a combination of symptoms? Yeah, I think decision making this, this um, fall, uh, <laughs> the 6 to 8 a.m. period is going to be a time when we're all going to be making a lot of decisions <laughs> um, each day. <laughs> Um, um, we've talked about, um, you know, having hotlines for parents in terms of, you know, calling uh, folks to say, um, calling your doctor saying, you know, what, this, this is the symptom that we have, should I go to school? Um, I would say that I would just err on the side of caution, you know, for all of us. Um, you know, if I have a slight sore throat, I'm going to stay home. Um, I, it's just so much easier in the entire world of coronavirus to stay home for a day than to subsequently expose a, a whole school um, and a whole classroom. Um, so I would say um, you might want to, the, the first time that you're seeing symptoms in your children, you're going to want to be speaking to your healthcare providers and your school nurses. But I, I would, um, for your planning this fall, for parental parent planning this fall, please try to keep your children home if they're symptomatic. We're down to the last two. So thank you for hanging with us. But. Um... I work for a Head Start zero to five. If we send a child home with a common symptom and provider states they are okay to return and they may not have been seen, but they continue to have the symptom, how long should we accept that okay decision if symptoms continue? Um, you know, this is one of the things I think of Head Start is I think of the kid with the chronically runny nose, right? <laughs> I mean, they're kind of constantly have that runny nose. Um, uh, I think, you know, the longer that a symptom like runny nose goes on, the less likely it is to be coronavirus. You know, it's more likely to be that kind of chronic rhinitis that the kids, that toddlers have all winter long that we as parents <laughs> have suffered through. Um, if, you know, we're, the, but, but that being said, this is a time to work in concert with um, providers. This isn't, you know, if you feel 
like something's just not right about that children, that child's symptoms, um, you, you're spending a lot of time with that child. You understand what they're, what they're like normally. Um, you, their parents understand what they're like normally. Ask for a reevaluation. You know, if, if you feel like it's just not behaving um, as you would think the diagnosis does. I say this to, to parents all the time. This is what I'm diagnosing you with and this is what it should behave like. If it doesn't behave that way, then you need to come back. And, and talk to me about it again. And I would say the same would be true as we're um, working together this fall um, it, with, with Head Start or schools or any various daycare. Great, and then the last question, and while I um, read it, oh, so many, okay, the second to last question. Um, while I read it in, and we answer those, I'm, I am going to launch the poll um, for all of you to just to start answering some quick uh, eight questions. So if you wouldn't mind um, starting to um, go through the poll while we listen to the last two questions and answers, that would be great, thank you. Um, is it true if someone, both kids and adults, has symptoms but refuses to be tested, they can be excluded from school for the 10-day quarantine period? Yes. So that was an easy one. Um, it would be great if you could answer all the questions in print as well as live. Oh, okay. Good to know for our next webinar. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, um, I, no, I do appreciate that feedback. Thank you. It is a bit tricky trying to get all the questions answered while listening, um, but we're, we're perfecting that. Um, but I will say that we are recording this um, webinar and it, it will be available as soon as we end on our Facebook um, page and we'll also get it up on our website for those of you that don't have Facebook so um, there's always um, the availability to go back and rewatch um, the webinar to listen to the questions and answers. Um, we did have one more question come in. Our school board has spent time fending off politi politicized rejections of mask wearing. We're worried about a possible increase in bullying and risk-taking behavior outside of class. Any advice? Um, I, I mean, I would say you would treat bullying behavior around masks no different than you would treat bullying behavior in school on a regular basis. Um, it's, you know, I think one of the best um, examples I've heard is we have dress codes in schools. We tell children that, you know, what's appropriate to wear in schools. And right now, masks are appropriate to wear in schools. And so if you're getting pushback with, um, as a school board, um, from you know f uh, specific family members, then I would encourage your leadership to engage those family members on a one-on-one -on -one basis to make sure that we understand that this is the safety f for all of our kids, and it's important that our schools are able to educate our kids, and everybody has a right to a free and appropriate public education, and that means that we all have the right to be safe. Um, and whether it be safe from illness because we're wearing a mask or safe from bullying, all those things fall under the same protocol. And you're not going to treat bullying any differently um, around mask wearing than you would treat around any other um, situation um, in which a bullying circumstance would arise. Um, that would be my advice. I do understand it's very, very, very tricky for school boards and school leadership right now. Um, I think I say this at the end of every COVID-19 webinar, we have never done this before. This is the first time any of us have ever done this. As frustrating as it is to hear the I don't knows, there really are still a lot of I don't knows. And as a parent, I understand how frustrating it is. I also have a husband who's a teacher. So I understand how frustrating it is for schools to um, try to be putting all these plans in place and um, taking on the risk of educating our students while keeping them safe. I don't envy our school leaders right now. Um, and, I, and I would say that we have um, a lot of leaders and a lot of teachers who um, want what's right for all of our children, wanna be back in our classrooms. Um, that's what they do, that's what they love to do, um, but they want our kids to be safe too. So as frustrating as this time is for our families and our parents, um, I would engage you in being patient. I would engage you in making sure that you're getting your individual needs met by asking your school leadership and working up your chain of command within your school to get your individualized needs met and make the best choice for your family to keep your child educated and safe. And I don't have, oh, well, we had one more question probably. Is the PM 2.5 filter in mass effective? I am not sure about that particular mask, so I would have to look that up and I would be happy to do that and look that up. 
Great. So we do have a couple of questions um, that Dr. Blaisdell has agreed to look up, and we will post the answers on our Facebook page um, of those two questions. Um, one was the um, poison control around hand sanitizer for kids who have um, their hands in their mouth, and the other one was around the 2.5 filter for masks. So with that, I think we have successfully answered all the questions. I want to um, thank Dr. Blaisdell for her generous time this morning and um, the main uh, Academy of American Pediatrics who have been in constant contact with me during this summer and engaging Family Voice. They really want to hear from families. Um, they work with us directly. They've been in contact with me on a regular basis um, and I've um, learned a lot from them and I have been humbled by what they're having to deal with as well. So um, thank you to them and, and thank you Dr. Blaisdell for spending time with us this morning. I really appreciate it. I know you're extremely busy. So from all of our families, thank you so much. Thank you. I'm here. So with that, we'll end the webinar. Again, um, this webinar will be available live on our Facebook page as well as on our um, website um, by the end of the week, the Facebook page by tomorrow or actually by the end of this webinar. Um, thank you all for joining us. I really appreciate um, you spending the time with us this morning. And please know that Maine Parent Federation is always available to you. So um, any questions or concerns, you can feel free to email or give us a call. Uh, I'll put my email address in the chat real quick. And um, again, thank you so much for joining us and have a great day.